What's up, everybody? How's it going? Across the church, are you doing good? You have got to wake up and do a little better than that. We are about to experience the presence of God. His word is about to pierce our hearts, transform our lives. And so you can't give God patty cake claps when you're about to get wrecked. All right? So I want you one more time at all of our campuses, everywhere watching right now, put your hands together. Give God the highest praise because he's worthy of it. That's what I'm talking about. Let's get after it. I'm excited because we're in this series uh, about the family. and, And as such, I get the honor to speak on the topic of godly manhood. Now, I, I think uh, I, I have an angle, maybe a, be, because I'm a man and have a unique perspective as being in the mix, okay? And so I'm, I'm excited to talk to us today about what that means. And so, uh, so pay attention. South Shore, Plant City, all right, Tampa, we're coming for you. We're ready for what God is wanting to say to our men. Now, uh, I don't know, some of you, you, you may have... Uh, in, in studying scripture, understood that there is a particular role that God designed man for. Uh, first of all, he, he created man first. It doesn't mean he's best. He created him first. And there's a reason, because whenever you're born, whenever you come first, you're responsible for what comes after you. Okay, so, so God created man first. And, and, and what a lot of people don't know is that actually man Go, will, will go to heaven at the rapture uh, first. There's just not long, but there, there's a period of time where man goes first. And you, you'll find this laid out in Revelation chapter 8 when it says this. When the lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. <laughs> which tells me that the women had not arrived yet. But they were on their way. Get a 30-minute, just, God's like, just take a breath, guys. Now, I'm excited because uh, in, in Genesis chapter 2, it does begin to tell the story of man. Not just mankind, but man. In, in chapter 1, he does a general telling of the story of, of what he did. But in chapter 2, he breaks down how and why he did it. And and so in chapter 2, you'll find your purpose, men, right here inside this one verse. Your, Your reason for existing, your position, your responsibility, all of it is encapsulated right here inside one verse. How many of you want to hear what God has to say about your purpose? Huh? How many know you're created for purpose? And in this one verse, in verse 15 of chapter 2, God says this. Then the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to tend it. Okay, I want to explain something because God did not put Adam anywhere until he had created an atmosphere designed for Adam. Think about it. Before God placed the stars in place, he created the firmament. He had to create space in order to put stars and sun and moon in their position. And and then, and then God created the seas. And then once he created the atmosphere of the sea, he placed the fish in it. And then then God said, well, I'm not done yet, so I'm going to create the land. And he began to create the land. And once he created land, he put vegetation in it. He didn't put vegetation before he created land because what you're designed for requires an atmosphere designed for you. And so he created this atmosphere. And then once he had created land and all of the atmosphere, he created four rivers and they began to flow into a region. And he designed this specific place called Eden. And it wasn't until he had created Eden that he took man, he took the male and he said, I'm going to place you in Eden. And I want you to understand why. Because Eden was designed for one reason. It wasn't to show off how good he was. He had already created the stars for that. 
It wasn't for any other reason except to have a place to encounter the presence of God. Every day, Adam would walk in the cool of the day with the Lord, him and, him and God on a journey, just, just all up in God's presence. Because man, listen, you men, you were designed for God's presence. Now, we've let the world distract us from that. We've let the world, we've started believing lies. That's how you end up with a church where we've released the presence of God, the management of the presence of God over to our, our women. That's why churches are full of, of women today and, and, and not as many men, but, but not here, not, not, not at the crossing. I, I'm, I, I know that in this atmosphere, we are raising up men who step into their position and do what they were created to do, which is manage the presence of God for their family, their friends, their jobs, their culture, their community. God has created you to own, to tend, to cultivate the presence of God. It's not feminine. The presence of God is not a feminine experience. Crying out in worship is not a feminine experience. Falling on your face before God is not a feminine experience. Raising your hands in adoration of the King of kings and Lord of lords is not a feminine experience. It is a masculine encounter that you were designed to do. It only it takes strength to stand before the King of kings and to call him what he is, which is God of the universe, sovereign and in control. My author and my perfecter, I am surrendered to you holy. That is a actually a masculine stance it takes strength for you to stand before the king you are designed for his presence and it's time that the church understands that I am not designed to stand back in in quiet uh, uh, steady non non moving non engaging that we, we have believed the lie that it is a man's job to stand stoically let the women cry before the Lord. That is perversion. That is a twisting of God's intention. If God expected it to be a women-only experience, he would have placed Eve there. He didn't even give Adam his Eve until he had given him his presence first. Because a man cannot properly honor, develop, process his wife, his Eve, until he has first learned to manage himself in the presence of God. Amen. And so God tells him, I've got this place for you. And I've got a place designed just for you. It's a place so special that, that inside of you, man, is the inclination to dwell in my presence. I give you authority to walk up into my presence and, and not only to be in my presence, he said the next thing he told him, the first assignment he gave Adam after he gave him his presence was not to give him his wife. He didn't say, here's my presence, now here's your wife. He said, here's my presence, now grow it. Wait a minute. So my responsibility as a man is to take the presence of God and expand it, cultivate it, make it grow, make it more accessible. My job as a man is to create an atmosphere in my home where God's presence is so thriving that when my kids wake up in the morning, they walk into the presence of God that I've created in my home. My wife wakes up in the presence of God because of the atmosphere that I've set. When I go into my job, some of you think your job is your purpose. No, your purpose is your purpose. Your, his presence is your purpose. Your job is just something you do so you can take your, his purpose somewhere. Your job is just something you do where you carry his presence. And so your job is an atmosphere, an opportunity that God has presented you in order for you to grow his presence in the world. You are to cultivate his presence. You are to cultivate 
opportunities for those around you because as men, you are called to lead. You, you were not set in place. You, we, we misunderstand what it means when we say the man is the head of the house. You got to understand, we, we, we have believed a, a worldly understanding of what headship is. The Bible says, if you want to be first, you've got to be last. So, so headship in God's understanding is not a domineering uh, 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 position. It's not a dictatorship that God has set you up for. God's design for you is to be the foundation. God's design for you is to be the floor that the rest of your, your culture, your environment, your community, your home, your job, your, your business that you own, you are supposed to be the servant that, cre that brings increase to those around you. You are there to serve. You are designed to carry weight that no one else can carry because you are designed to carry the presence of his glory. Now, as you cultivate his presence, he doesn't just say, I want you to grow it and cultivate it. He tells us, I want you to tend it. Now, that word tend actually means protect. So we have a calling, and a lot of men have no problem being protectors. We like to see ourselves as protectors, right? We, we like to see our, ourselves as, as being when, when When I'm walking around with my wife, my wife don't walk on the side of the road. She walks away from the road. I get between her and cars. What am I going to do? I have no idea. I have no plan past I'll get between you and this car. I guess I just, I'm banking that I'm going to push her out of the way and stop the car like a superhero. But I feel like a man when I'm standing in between the ones I love and the ones that want to harm them. That is, that is naturally in, in, in us. It is part of us. But many times we will, we will get so caught up in, in the protection part, like, like, well, I own 14 guns, and I'm from Plant City. I, I own 14 too. I, you know, I ain't got a problem with that. But, but we, we act like, you know, because I hunt, I'm a man. Because I fish, I'm a man. Because I have a lot of, I'm willing to shoot somebody, I'm a man. Because I can fight well, I'm a man. And the tr truth is that it is not the protection of the people or even your toughness that causes you to be a man. What causes you to be a man is that I'm willing to do the things that try to steal God's presence from those I love. I'm willing to cut things off that I enjoy if it steals the presence of God from my family. I'm willing to remove things from my own life. I'm willing to sacrifice my own self if it means that my children, my wife, my friends, my coworkers, my business, my employees get to experience a deeper walk with, the God, with God. I, get, I am willing to stand in between the things that are trying to steal their purpose I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to look bad on Facebook if it means I don't agree with what the world is saying because you're trying to steal purpose from my people. I'm willing to stand in the gap. That is true understanding of masculine protection. And every man in this room is designed to be four things. You are designed to be a priest, a prophet, a protector, and a provider. Those are your four jobs because inside of his presence, you find priest and prophet because a priest, his job is to represent the people before God. And, and the prophet's job is to represent God before the people. So that is done within the context of his presence. If you don't understand and operate and flow in a daily encounter with God's presence, you do not have the capacity to lead anyone else into his presence. How can I lead you to a place I can't go myself? 
So my job as priest and prophet is to engage with God and my people. And, and not only that, but I'm, I'm there to be a provider. Why? Just, just financial? If my wife makes more than me, that's fine. I don't care. I am providing an atmosphere where she can thrive. I am going to provide an atmosphere where my children find their purpose. I'm going to provide an atmosphere where the people around me are better tomorrow than they were today because I am creating an atmosphere where they can walk into his presence, understand their purpose and their calling, become equipped with everything that they need to thrive and to flourish. I want to see my wife take it to another level. I need to see her advancing. If she's not advancing, if my children aren't advancing, then I am not doing my job as provider. My job is to provide the environment where they thrive. That's my job. That's my job. And then I'm to protect, right? I'm supposed to protect that atmosphere. Pastor Jonas talked a little bit about it uh, last week when he talked about our children, the fact that we need to remove things and set things in place and put, put rules in place. Why? To, to overpower our children? No, to, so that we can create an atmosphere where they experience his presence or they experience the concept of family. They experience what it means to, to operate and, and to equip them, not with, with better video games, but with better understanding of how to engage the world around them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what our, our, our purpose is. Um, my, my daughter, um, I've been training her uh, to be a, an amazing wife. She's going, to, she's going to kill it. All right. She, she's, gonna, she's probably one of the prettiest things I've ever seen in my life. Right, she is. She, I've been, I've been putting skills into her. I've, she learned how to how to play instruments. She knows how to sing. She's she's uh, she's getting educated. She she knows how to cook. She can bake. She 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 knows how to she 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 knows how to scratch your back and rub your head just the right way. She knows how to she she's she is skilled. She is learning all the traits it's going to take to be an amazing wife. And 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 here's the thing. Here's the thing. Sometimes I forget because uh, you know I, I'm thinking about whatever's going on around me. And my daughter, when we go out to the car, we'll go on daddy-daughter dates and because I need her to understand what it looks like when a, when a real man uh, um, tries to love her. And I need to under, her to understand what it looks like when a man honors her well because you can't just be a jack leg busted up joker come up in my family. I ain't got room for you. I, I've been, I put too much investment in this little girl, right? And, and, and so, and so, uh, and so I'll come up and she'll be standing at the door and, and she'll go, she'll just stand there. She'll go, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'll go, oh yeah, sorry, forgot, come on. I'll open the door for her, right? And, and, and so we set things in place and, and, and uh, the other night we were watching a movie and, and I was sitting there and, and I noticed that she was not engaging with me. She was, she, we were watching the movie. First of all, the movie I had to wait on her to watch. I could watch it 10 times by the time she had the opportunity. But I waited so that I could watch this movie with her that she wanted. And, and so while I'm sitting there, I'm watching the movie. I look over, she's on her phone. And I said, oh, you just listening to the movie. And so I reached over. I said, you know what, baby? I'm going to do your husband a favor. And I'm going to teach you what it's like to love him well. And I grabbed that phone. I threw it across the room. I said, now hold my hand, and <laughs> we're going to sit right here and watch this movie together. Because there is an equipping that happens for women that you have the ability. That's why today is really, I know it's a men-focused thing, but, but ladies, I need you to be taking notes. Because I'm about to give you items to add to your prayer list. What I'm not giving you is items to add to your nag list. There's not enough words on the planet, and I know you know them all. There's not enough words on the planet for you to say them enough to convince your husband to, to learn, operate, and, and walk in the presence of God. You can't. You don't, have, that's, you don't have it in you. Because the only person that can, and can get your husband encountering the presence of God is God. So your job is to come alongside him. If you've got a husband that is not walking in the presence of God on a regular basis, not dialed into him, your job is to uplift him spiritually, to encourage and equip 
him spiritually, to, to come behind him and reinforce him in, in, in a way where, where you, you are not uh, emasculating him. You are encouraging and equipping and empowering him in spiritual truth. You are praying for him. Do you pray for your husband and do you love him submittedly? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so God said right after he created this atmosphere and he put man in it, we skip down to verse 18 and it says, Then the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Ladies, this is your job. This is where you come into the picture. So after God created his presence and gave it to man, then he gave him his job. He gave him his purpose. Do you notice that he did not give him his job until he had give, he did not give him a woman until he gave him his purpose? Because if you ever find a man who doesn't have his purpose yet, he is not ready for you. Single ladies, if you do not find a man who understands his purpose, can operate and thrive in the presence of God. It is not that he's bad, he's just not the right, he's not ready for you. Because how can he disciple you and take you in deeper into the things of God if he himself does not know what it's like to walk into the deep things of God? So God said, I'm going to create a suitable help, a, su- a helper suitable. And I love that phrase. It's Ager, Azer Negeb. Azer Negeb. And, and that means, uh, it means helper uh, uh, compatible, helper suitable. And, and, and in our English language, we don't really understand that well because we think helper is a lower operation. Like the, the main person, you help the main person. But that's not the understanding. That's not a biblical understanding of what a, a suitable helper is. A suitable helper meant this is a person that is equal in, a, in power and in strength. They're just different in their strength. Their strength is what you are designed, women, to be strong in ways a man cannot be strong. You, you are, our wives are not weaker. Not, they are not, they are not a an inferior helper who just does some stuff that, you know, just to help us get along. No, there is a vision that God gives a man for his family. And the wife comes in as a complementary aspect to do the things that you simply don't have the capacity to do. Or to love you and to, to push you forward so that you have the energy and the strength to follow the vision that God has given for your family. It takes strength to do that. When I'm moving a heavy table, I don't go find skinny, no muscle people. I'll look across the room and I'll start, I'll, start, I'll judge you like that. I'll, I'll be like, mm, you ain't never lifted in your life. Have you ever seen a weight room? And I'll just, until I find someone who is as strong as me or, or at least, or stronger, who can help me do this lifting. My wife is not weaker than me. My wife is as strong as me. I found a woman who was as strong or stronger than I am to pick up the areas of my life that I simply don't have capacity to pick up. And so for me to honor that part of her life, I need to understand her role is not inferior to my role. Her role is vital to my role. And I cannot take our family where it needs to go if she is not equipped and empowered to do it. My job is to get her into his presence. Have you discipled your wife? Does your wife disciple you? Have you discipled your children? Or does the world disciple your children? You are called to live above that. And your wife was built to do what you simply cannot do. My wife sees things in me that I cannot see in myself. She'll come up to me and she'll say, what's wrong? I have no idea that anything is wrong. (laughs) The first few years of our marriage, I was like, are you crazy? Nothing's wrong. And three days later, I would melt down. I said, apparently, there was something wrong. Well, I have learned over time that it is a gifting that she has as the woman in my life for her to be able to look into me and say, what is wrong? And then I have learned now to go, oh, 
that's a part of me that I don't have the capacity to, to engage, but you do. And, and as such, I will listen because I told her, I said, if something is wrong with me, I don't even have the words to put it into context to even understand what's happening. And so, and so she will begin to pray for me, to encourage me. She'll start doing things for me that, I, that, that, that she knows lights me up. She'll, co- she'll come lay your head right here. I'm gonna, and she'll start scratching my back. She'll start preparing my breakfast in the morning. She'll start doing things around me that, it, that get me into a moldable position where God can begin to speak to me. And here's what's amazing about a submitted wife. My wife did this years ago. I, uh, w- many women sometimes get to a place where they go, what do I do when my husband does something that is not submission worthy? So years ago, I was leaving a ministry. I was at a ministry in Georgia, and I was, I was fried, man. I was, I was wounded. I was emotionally hurt. And, and, and I never told my family, I never told my wife what I was going through because I was attempting to protect her from the environment. I didn't want her to, to have an adverse reaction to the presence of God in that church. And so I would take on the weight of what was happening so that, so that she wouldn't be wounded by the, by the abuse to me. And in that process, instead of being healed, I allowed it to create bitterness in my life. And, and so in that season, one day I just snapped and I, and I, just, I, left, that, I left the church uh, just like that. Like I, I didn't, you know, I, it, was, it was a terrible, I was in a, just a bad mental place spiritually. I was in a rough place. And, and I went and I just said, that's it. We're leaving. I went home. Can you imagine your husband just showing up just like, pack up. We're leaving tomorrow, you know, and, and, I, and I was kind of like that. I said, that's it. We're going back. We're, go, we're leaving, going to Florida. We're out of here, and, uh, and, and we're, we're done here. And, and she was like, oh, okay, uh, can I finish cooking dinner? Like, she was like, it was like, I, I'm, we're ready to go, you know. And, and so she had no idea. And, and so instead of, and she loved it there. She, she, was, she we had a home. She was a stay-at-home mom. She was raising our, our kids. She was, uh, had, had her friends there. Her, her life was there. She, she was perfectly content. Loved it. She was having the time of her life. And so for her, she had to, to, she could either have badgered me or she could come alongside of me. Now, to come alongside of me in my wounded hour meant she would have to give some stuff up. Her right to be right. Her right to say what she wanted to say. And in this whole process, I can promise you, she never once made me feel bad about any decision I made, even though it was not the right decision. It was not the right time. And so I left and I took the whole family, and, and we, it was in uh, 2008, and y'all know there wasn't, you couldn't buy a job in 2008. And so we, we, were, we were in a season of struggle, and, and here's, what's, here's what happened. God provided. If I, if I could explain to you how he provided, I look back now, and, and I'm like, this is incredible. I mean, we, he not only gave us a, a free house, during that time, but gave us a pool with it. Never had to pay a dime. He, he, he sustained us. And, and not only that, but, but we did things like, like we used to get free tickets to Bush Gardens and free tickets to Monster Jam. And for Plant City, that's a big deal. And we would get free tickets to shows in Tampa, and we would get free whatever, and, and, and stuff just started coming. God was providing, and, and I'm telling you, I look, I, I asked the Lord about it, and, and he said, I didn't, I didn't sustain you because you were so obedient to me. You disobeyed me. I didn't sustain you because you did what was right. I sustained you because your wife did. Your wife submitted in such a way that it honored me. And because of her submission, my family was able to prosper. We don't always get it right. That's why we need the partnership with our wives. And wives, 
We need you to be the strength that we don't have when we don't have it. And for us, because respect is the only language we understand. And understand this, we understand respect. The Bible says in Ephesians that men ought to love their wives. You know, it never tells a wife to love her husband. It tells a wife to respect her husband. Read it, Ephesians 5, uh, uh, chapter 5, 33. It never tells a wife to love her husband. Why? Because love is an easy language for you. Respect is hard. But respect is the only language that we understand. Because we were created, think about it. We were created for the glory, for his presence. We were created for an atmosphere of honor. God, his first thing with us was to create an atmosphere of honor. And anytime we feel dishonor, we will absolutely shut down. We will lose our mind. And so the thing that you're trying to get out of your husband, you will never get from disrespect. You will never get from dishonor. Your husband only speaks one language and it is honor. Every man in the room knows this truth. And this is the powerful thing. When I'm doing counseling, I'm doing marriage counseling and and pre-marriage counseling. I explain this verse so critically because it is so important for you to understand this truth. Men, when men talk to one another, we understand this one truth. At any moment, if one of us says the wrong thing or does the wrong thing, somebody could get hurt. They, come on, men. You know I'm telling the truth. We sitting, we, we engage one another with this principle. All right, I'm going to regulate myself because I don't know what this guy's capable of. And I don't want to find out today. And the only men who end up falling into to that is that one of them could not regulate themselves. If there's a fight, one of the guys could not regulate themselves. And they pushed beyond what is capable. And so there's a moment, but there is a moment, I promise you. Every man knows it. When I'm talking to this dude, I've got to watch what I say. Because if I dishonor him far enough, we will engage. And one of us is going to hurt. But women, you don't understand that understanding. There's never, I, my wife has never one time in her life ever had a conversation with the girl behind the counter at Walmart and thought, well, this might end up in blows. The problem is you ain't been hit in the face enough growing up. Men understand I've been punched a few times. I don't like it. So I regulate myself. And so, so many times men also understand uh, as a man, my job is to guard my wife. And so I, I cannot strike her. I cannot treat her like I treat dudes. No, this is not, I'm just being real. Can I be real just for a second? I can't, I can't treat her like I treat the guys. And so it creates a frustration when she talks to me like a disrespectful guy. So what do I do with a wife that doesn't honor me? I collapse. I'm trapped and I begin to break down. But a wife that understands true submission is not subservitude. It is an empowerment that comes from the strength within me to empower you to accomplish the vision God has set for you to fulfill for our family. That's power. That's real power. And so there's a few things in your notes, and I won't be able to get to them today. It was just God took us in a little different direction. But in in 1 Timothy, he lists out the characteristics of what it means to be a man. And you, you can find all of those there. there it, it's, you wanna go through those. And, and ladies, that's your prayer list. So go into the notes, that's your prayer list. First Timothy chapter three, verse one through seven. That's your prayer list. In that whole section, don't get confused because it says overseer. Overseer just means leader. And so what Paul is telling Timothy is anytime you're looking for a leader, which every man ought to be a leader, 
You are built to be a leader. You're a leader in your home, a leader in your church, a leader in your job, a leader with your children. You, you are not meant to, to follow. You are meant to lead others into the presence of God. And so if you are a leader, he says, then what you need when you're looking for a leader is you are looking for a man of God. And so he begins to list what a man of God is. And so if you're not married, that's your prayer list for your partner. They should meet those check marks, ladies. And men, if you do not match up to those check marks, you are, you are, you've got some work to do because your family needs you to be all of those things. Even if you're not married right now, your future family needs you to be all of those things. God has called you men to be four things. Priest, prophet, protector, provider. Of what? Not the things of this world, which are fleeting, of the presence of God. Can you represent your family in intercession before the God of the universe? That is the priest. Can you clean and purify your family? That was the job of the priest. Can I take God's word that I'm receiving as I'm studying and impart it into my family? That is the role of the prophet. Can I cast vision for where this family is going? Do I provide an atmosphere for my family to thrive? And do I protect the presence of God in my home? So many times, guys, we are the ones who got rid of the presence of God in our home. Because we can't control our own anger. We can't control our own vices. I was watching a Navy SEAL tell the story. He said he was able and willing to go into any building in America or in the world. He didn't care. If I knew there were terrorists in it, I didn't care. I, I would go on any mission that I was sent on without fear. The one thing I feared more than anything was praying out loud over my wife. That happens for a couple reasons. And a lot of you men recognize that feeling. This, this fear of, of being the spiritual leader in our home. For this fear that we are not built or equipped. That Navy SEAL had been trained and equipped and gone through so many trainings that he was not afraid at all to encounter the enemy. But he had never been equipped in the presence of God. And so to bring that into his home was the most fearful thing he'd ever done. And what's crazy is uh, there was a survey, a, a, report, a, a, a statistic done where they, they found out that couples that pray out loud over one another regularly, the divorce rate is one in 1,152. Okay, you're like, I don't, you're throwing a lot of numbers. That's less than 1%. The divorce rate in America is between 50 and 60%. The, the, the divorce rate within the church is slightly less than that, but it's still in, in the range of 40, 50%. So literally, husbands stopping to grab your wife to pray over her to bless her, to lead her, to speak life over her will slice 99% of the marriage divorce issues in your life out of your life. But it's the one thing that we won't do. Not this church. Not these men. Are there men here watching at our campuses that would stand up right in this moment and say, no more, I surrender and say, Father, use me to take me to another level of your presence so that I can take the people around me 
Are there any men that would stand up? Go ahead, stand. You say, that's you. You know what? I'm taking the stand for my family. I'm taking the stand for my future. I'm taking the stand for my business. I'm taking the stand for my neighbors. I'm taking the stand for my community. Every campus, stand up. Can I pray over you men right now? Father, we declare a release of the, your power and your strength. Let your strength be our strength. Let your presence be our strength. Father, we run into you and we are safe. We're tired of running into ourselves because we just don't have the capacity. There's not enough earthly stuff that I can buy to fill the void that I was created for. But today, I surrender it all. Today, today I commit to your presence. Today, I understand that you built me for your presence, for nothing else but your presence. And while I've been protecting my family from the evils of the world, I have surrendered the most important thing to protect them from things that steal your presence from their life. And so today, God, I repent as your man I say, God, use me. Fill me. Restore me. And I commit to cry out to your presence every day. Father, pour your blessing on these men. Pour your presence out on the men of this church. Fill us with a passion for your glory, a passion for your presence. And we'll give you all the glory, all the honor. In Jesus' name. Would everyone else join them? Would you just stand to your feet at, at every, every campus? There, there is an element of the journey of manhood. And some of you, you've never taken that journey. You've never walked into it. But this is really more than just men. This is our, our women, our men, our young people. Listen, this is a moment for you to encounter the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're saying, you know what? I want to walk into his presence. The only way to access his presence is through his blood. Christ alone. And here's what you need to know. Here is the gospel. Whatever you've done, men, women, whatever you've done, God loves you and wants a relationship with you. You're, no, you're a murderer. doesn't matter. God loves you. wants a relationship with you. But I lie a lot. God loves you. wants a relationship with you. I'm a homosexual. God loves you. wants a relationship with you. I'm an adulterer. God loves you. wants a relationship with you. Isn't that good news? And if you're willing to accept that good news, I've got bad news. In the same way that he died for you, you have to die for him. You die to your will. You die to your agenda. You die to your plan. You surrender your life to the glory of God. He is now your king and your Lord. And if you're feeling that burden today to make that stand, I want you to pray this prayer. In fact, I want everyone to join with them and just pray this prayer together at every campus. I want you to say this. Just say, Father, I recognize that I need you. I've tried it on my own, and it just doesn't work. I can't do enough or be enough. But with you, I understand that I can make it, that I can have the fullness of the purpose that you created for me. And so I surrender my life to you, and I ask you to take control of me. I recognize that you are king, you are savior, you died for me, you rose again, that I might have life. And so I accept that gift today. And I offer myself back fully. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer at any of our campuses, watching online, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe you've been away from God and you're saying, you know what, I'm making a stand today. I'm reconnecting with the Father. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand just proud as you can do it. One, two, three.